Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alientude, and today I am reviewing this Balor Arms Kriegsmesser. And collaborating with me today is my good friend and fellow sword reviewer here on YouTube, Kane Shen. He's got a lot of great reviews. I've linked to several of them and sampled a few in my reviews. I highly recommend checking out his videos and his channel. He's a great reviewer. And today we're going to be collaborating on reviewing this Kriegsmesser. So a little background on this sword and ordering it. It sold new for $468 and I bought it as part of the first pre-order of this model. Cult of Athena seems to open up pre-orders from time to time for it. Right now the one for August of this year is currently sold out. Cult of Athena contracts this out to LK Chen and they make the sword. I put a link in the description to the listing for this sword without my Cult of Athena affiliate code. If you want to support the channel, check out the description. There's a whole section there with a variety of ways you can do so. So this Kriegsmesser was originally going to be produced by the first forge that made Balor Arm stuff, OTC. I've talked quite a bit about this in various different reviews on Balor Arm swords, so if you want to know more about that, check out previous videos. But when Cult of Athena and OTC had a falling out, OTC took their Kriegsmesser design to Cold Steel and produced that one. And I have a review of that link up here. After Cold Steel released their Kriegsmesser, Cult of Athena kind of went back to the drawing board and did some revisions to the design to really make it change and distinguish it from the Cold Steel one. And talking about the design of the Kriegsmesser brings me to the elephant in the room, and that's the extremely similar design to the most famous Kriegsmesser that's been around, the Albion Connect, which I have right here. So with a very quick look, you can tell that the Balor Arms Kriegsmesser was obviously very heavily inspired by the Albion Connect, the biggest difference being in the hilt furniture. The biggest difference in the blade is that the Balor Arms is a little bit smaller in pretty much all dimensions. We'll get into more details in a moment. Now recently, Peter Johnson, the designer of the Connect and of most Albion swords, and one of the most famous swordsmiths and researchers in the world, it expressed some displeasure in the similarities, and he went so far as to call the Balor Arms Kriegsmesser uh, plagiarism of the Connect. Several other very prominent smiths agreed with him, such as Dr. Nathan Clow of Arms and Armor, Angus Trim, James Elmsley, some very prominent names. And I will put some of their comments on screen so that you can read what they have to say. Now I told Mr. Johnson that I would include his objections in this review, and I don't want to give just one side of the story, so I reached out to Cult of Athena to ask if they had any response to his complaints. Their owner said that he was reaching out to Mr. Johnson to discuss this, and he said he would provide me with a statement for this review. As of this recording, I have not received that statement. If I do receive one, I will put it in right here. After recording, I did receive a statement from the owner of Cult of Athena, David. This is what he said, and I will put it up on screen because it's quite a bit. The Kriegsmesser has differences and intentionally has differences from the Connect. However, they are obviously similar, and I have learned that the Connect did inspire the model, and it is to the eye too close for comfort. I am approaching this the same way I have looked at everything at Cult of Athena since I purchased it in late November 2020 always transparently, and depending on the situation, admitting faults or defending ourselves. In this case, the Kriegsmesser as it stands should not be in the market. I am a newbie to the community and admittedly still learning about its history. The Kriegsmesser was a finished prototype and ready to be put into production when I purchased the company. It is beautiful and felt great in the hand and I couldn't wait to launch it. There were many starts and stops, but we finally got it out this year. I did not know about the Connect until you contacted me. I have told Peter that after 2023 production is finished, which is in process and financially for a small business can't be stopped, we will not produce this model. Instead, we will launch a new Kriegsmesser in 2024. 
Some may be skeptical about my ignorance, but I am new to the community and over 1,800 models have passed through our warehouse since I purchased the business, and those are the ones I have the most knowledge of. With the total of 8,000 SKUs that have passed through our warehouse, I do not and cannot know every one we have sold, nor the list of models that were produced by makers in that time or prior to that time that were not sold here. So I hope the community takes my prior actions into account when judging this. In 2021, I chose to tell the community that two of our internal brands were misrepresenting the type of steel used in swords we brought to the market between 2018 and 2021. I started the steel certification program, randomly testing and asking for statements from our suppliers, with some providing original documents, stating that it was as advertised. We regularly review items before they ship and contact customers when an item does not match first quality standards, offering a munitions grade or blemished discount. I ceased doing business with a dishonest manufacturer related to the Kriegsmesser, and when previously contacted by Peter about a model that was a direct reproduction of his designs, I immediately removed it from the site. In all of those instances, we absorbed a financial hit in order to not just maintain, but I hope improve our standing as the most trusted destination to buy and for makers to sell their models. For our internal brands, we will continue to uphold high standards and use our knowledge and best judgment for items listed on the site. There will, I am sure, be fine lines. This is not one of them. I hope you communicate this in full. I have no problem with debate in this community and criticism and praise for Cult of Athena. So, since I am lucky enough to own a Kinect, I figured I should do a pretty in-depth comparison here, something that most people will not be able to do. So this is going to take up the majority of this review. It's gonna be structured a little different than most of my reviews. First off, here is a graphic with the measurements comparing them between the two swords. And I will include my normal measurements graphic later in the review. As you can see, the stats are pretty similar, with most overall dimensions being different by about an eighth to a quarter of an inch. The Connect blade is about a half inch longer, and its overall length is one inch longer. The Balor Arms is five ounces lighter, with a point of balance two inches closer to the hilt. This is caused mostly by two things. The Connect starts one millimeter thicker and stays around that much thicker for most of the blade. The Balor Arms is also a bit less of a wide blade, with a somewhat more pronounced hourglass or wasted shape. The Connect has this too, but it's very subtle. This does mean that they handle considerably different, and I will get into that a lot more in depth later in the review. Right now, I just want to talk about the design. The fuller lengths are almost the same, the width, the depth, they're all pretty much the same, and the overall profile of the blades is all but identical, with the exception that the Connect has this little step in the spine that the Balor Arms does not. So I can see Mr. Johnson's point of view, especially because the blades are just so very similar. That said, there are other Kriegsmessers on the market that share this basic profile. There is one from Purple Heart Armory slash VB Sword Shop that I'll put on screen right here, and you can tell it's very similar as well. Whether or not Mr. Johnson is aware of that product, I have no idea. So obviously the place where they are most dissimilar is in the hilt work, especially the guard. The Albion Connect has a pretty simple guard that is mostly cylindrical in shape that flares out towards the tip of the quillin, and there's a little bit of a groove cut in here. The Nagel is pretty simple and just kind of flares up right here. And the Balor Arms is considerably more detailed. For more on that, let's see what Kane has to say. More elaborate guard, uh, like the Nago and the Cross Guard, as a connect, has a very uh, minimalist, has some subtle geometry, some tapering, right? And it looks great. And I just love, love the simplicity, yet elegant look of it. But the, this one, if you can just look at the Nago, it's just like more pronounced tapering, flaring out, right? And has a central ridge, so it's like some kind of uh, fluted geometry, right? I think it's inspired by one of the examples in uh, the Museum of Art History in Vienna. And uh, clearly this guard is also inspired by some of the uh, uh, hunting measures owned by Emperor Maximilian I. And I think that that helps it stand out from uh, its, its primary inspiration, which is the connection. So like Kane said, the quillins are riffened and flare out into a mushroom shape, and the nagel is pretty heavily fluted. 
That said, the overall profile of the guard is very similar along with the rest of the blade. If I had the Photoshop skills necessary to get a silhouette of each sword, there would be very little difference, I believe. Moving on to the grip, the connect I have is the Mark II, which means it is a hidden tang rather than the full width tang that you'll see on most Messers and the Balor Arms one. The colors of the wood are very similar, although the Balor Arms is a little bit lighter, and the pins in the Balor Arms are copper, whereas it looks like they are steel in the connect. They both have this channel running down the length of the grip, and the Balor Arms one is a little bit deeper than the connects. The connect is also better shaped in that it starts a little bit thinner here up at the guard and flares out towards the pommel. This is a very common design you'll see on Messers, and the Balor Arms lacks it. It's just one straight line. The pommel is your classic beak shape one with the kind of cut out from the grip going all the way through the pommel as opposed to terminating in the pommel like I'll see, you'll see on a lot of Messers. I haven't seen this specific design before and I asked Kane about it and this is what he said. Yeah, this is a very peculiar um, design choice. Right, even the uh, cold steel, the original model, the uh, prototype for this model has the, uh, the groove terminating before the end of the pommel, right? And this one just goes through. And yeah. that's that's quite different from most of the period examples. And it's, uh, it's a little bit strange, but I don't, I don't find it particularly uh, bothering. In addition to that, the Kinex ha definitely has more geometry to it. It thins out some and is overall just a lot more refined of a shape, whereas the Balor Arms is pretty much even thickness throughout. The pommels of both are peened to the tang, and the Connect has a very small square pommel, whereas the Balor Arms has a much bigger rounded pommel. The construction of the Nagel, both of them are peened through. However, the tolerances on the Connect are considerably better, which is to be expected. It's a triple the cost sort. But on the Balor Arms one, I can actually fit a small piece of printer paper in between the guard and the Nagel, which is something that I can't do on the Connect. So that's my overview of the comparison between the two swords design. Is there enough differentiating the Balor Arms from the Connect so that it is not problematic? Well, this is my opinion only. I uh, totally respect Mr. Johnson's opinion. I especially respect his right to have that opinion. And as a designer, I can understand why he is perturbed. For me personally, I think there are just enough differences so that it's not a problem. Clearly, the Balor Arms was heavily inspired by the Connect, but I think there are enough differences in the specs of the blade, in the details in the hilt, that it's not a direct copy, it's not plagiaristic, in my opinion. This is, again, my opinion. I think everybody has a right to their opinion, and I absolutely respect Mr. Johnson's opinion on it. And to avoid this kind of issue, I think Colt Fathina could go back to the drawing board again and refine the blade some more and really make it their own. Perhaps they could make the blade straight. They could put in a different fuller design, maybe one thin one and one longer one. They could put in solid pins, make the noggle something that is, does not look like a fluted copy of the Connect. There's a lot of things they could do to just continue differentiating it from the Connect, still inspired by but not quite so close. And since I know Colt Athena is reaching out to Mr. Johnson, maybe we'll see a Balor Arms Kriegsmesser Mark II. So let's move on to something that is unequivocally unique to the Balor Arms, and that is this very striking scabbard. So it's a wood core scabbard with black leather, a metal throat and shape, and this kind of floral design that's kind of laser etched in, I, th I think. I know it's etched, I think it's by laser. And the leather feels a little different than most scabbards you'll see on the market. I know LK Chen went to great lengths to source cow leather for their scabbards. So I, I don't know if it's veg tanned or not. It just feels a little bit different than most scabbards I'm familiar with. So the two metal pieces here are cast metal. You can clearly see that they're cast because there's casting lines and just general flaws in them that are reminiscent of casting. Could be cleaned up better, not a big deal at this price point. They do not react to a magnet, 
and Cult of Athena lists them as stainless steel, and some stainless steel does not react to a magnet, so that's believable. I like the little floral design up here. It kind of matches the floral design etched into the leather, and the shape is very attractive, although it's a little reminiscent of some of Todd Cutler's shapes, especially this little decorative ball at the end. The metal throat does not wrap around the wood of the scabbard on the mouth here, so it does not interact with the blade's edge at all, which is good. There's no chance of any dulling as the blade slides out. The wood core on this is very similar to the Italian longswords in that it's thick and doesn't taper at all. And that combined with the steel furniture here makes this a pretty hefty scabbard. The fit of the sword to the scabbard is actually quite good. There's a little bit of rattle here, not a lot, and I can hold it upside down and shake vigorously. It doesn't come out, but when I pull, it's very easy to draw. So I covered quite a bit of the details about the sword during the comparison to the Kinect, but here, there's a few other things I want to talk about. First off, here's my measurements. So with the hilt, the wood scales have shrunk a little bit and the tang sticks out just a little bit. There's a very small ledge here. It's not sharp, it doesn't bite my hands when I swing it around, but if the wood shrinks any more, I think could see that becoming a problem. This is very common on this style of grip construction. I think I bet you that's one reason Albion on the Mark II Connect went to a hidden tang to prevent this problem. Now, what does sometimes bite into the hand are the pins. These are actually, I can feel each one, there's a little bit of a ledge on each one, and the pins are rougher finished than the grip. The grip is pretty damn smooth and the pins feel a little rough. Every so often when I'm swinging it, my finger will land in just the right place where it feels the pin. It doesn't hurt, but it's a slight bit of discomfort there. With the noggle, if you watched Matthew Jensen's review, link up here, you know that it is peened through, but it is not keyed. Now, is blocking a Naginata strike, as Matthew Jensen did, an intended use of the noggle? Well, I asked Kane that also because he's a lot more familiar with historical European martial arts. Let's see what he has to say. I don't think so. I think for most part, uh, in master fencing, this noggle is usually generally like an extra piece of protection where you turn it around in a winding uh, motion where the opposing blade comes down and they just clash. Not, not necessarily, like, like, not in a chop down. You can't hope to catch a full force like it's just a direct hit with this because it's just too short if you miss by an inch your, your hand is gone so you, you basically it's, it's like an extra mechanism for you to wind to threaten them right um so i think taking a full force blow from a whole arm isn't like not uh enduring that without any looseness it isn't necessarily like uh um such a negative uh aspect on, on it but it can definitely be improved uh, if it's pinned through and it's key, it should be durable enough uh, to protect your hand in most cases. So I agree with Kane. While it would be nice to see the noggle keyed into the slot, it's not an egregious flaw in my opinion because the noggle's not really designed to take full force blows. And let me hasten to say that I am not criticizing Matthew Jensen's test here. This is what he does and it's good information to have. I'm just providing extra context to the information. The casting quality of the guard could be improved in my opinion. There's some pits here and there and some leftover spurs. These aren't a big deal, but they could be improved. Now personally, I really dislike the finish of the metal here. It's kind of got like a bumpy look that to me screams modern cheap. Now that's not to say it is a cheap quality. That's not at all what I'm saying. It's just that the look says to me cheapness and I would just like to see it a much more satin finish. Let's move on to the blade. It has some rippling in it, not a lot, but there is some there, and it's a very even satin finish that resists scratches and scuffs pretty easily. There's only a few places on the blade, mostly near the tip, where I see any scratches. The fullers end in almost the exact same spot on both sides. The blade narrows into a very acute tip, honestly probably a little too acute in my opinion. The Connect is a little bit more robust of a tip here. I think this could be reinforced a little bit 
like you'll often see in katana just to make it a little bit more durable in the thrust. I have a hunch that this tip would not withstand very many thrusts on hard targets without breaking or bending or something like that. Of course, that's just my opinion and speculation. I didn't do any hard thrust tests, just a hunch I have. So let's look at some paper cutting. I start here out near the tip, starts cutting, and then you notice it started tearing there, right? We'll get to why in just a moment. So it's struggling to bite in as it gets a little bit closer. And if I start back here, it starts tearing again. So what's going on here? Now let me show you what happens when I cut right at the sweet spot. As soon as I get past the sweet spot a little bit, it starts cutting. But at the sweet spot, it mostly tears. The sword is very sharp up here, incredibly sharp back here. And right at the sweet spot is the dullest part of the blade. And that's a bad spot for the dullest part to be. This is where you want to do all your cutting. And for this to be the dullest spot, that's problematic. So let's talk cutting. Uh, when it comes down to the cutting performance, you mentioned that you cut with the sword several times and basically it went smooth, but there's some challenge. I really struggled to get good clean cuts with the sword. I could get some good cuts and other times I would just kind of bash water bottles and pool noodles. You know, there's a few times where I had good edge alignment, nice fast cut, and it just dented the pool noodle. It didn't cut it at all. I haven't done tatami yet. I'm probably not going to with the sword because my cutting stand is in pieces. I don't think I'm gonna have time to do tatami for it. But what I found after a decent amount of cutting and then taking a piece of paper and testing various parts of the sword is that right at the sweet spot is the dullest part of the sword, which is, the worst place to have a dull spot because you know that's where you want to get all your cuts. If I cut right out here towards the tip or back behind the sweet spot, it cuts very well and gives me good clean cuts. But when I impact right at the sweet spot, it does a lot of bashing and doesn't give me good clean cuts. And I, at first I thought I was really struggling with my edge alignment because I wasn't getting good cuts, but after really inspecting and testing it, and when I feel it, it does still feel sharp here. It is still possible to get cuts here. It's just, it's the dullest part of the blade. Yeah, and that's my experience as well. But this one is a better example. It just, overall, it's sharpened very well. I would say like 95% of the edge is incredibly sharp. You can just take it out of the box and probably go do some cutting competition and it will suffice. But I did a few like mysterious bad cuts and it wasn't because the, the edge alignment was bad or any other reason or I suspected this blade is pretty flexible near the foible. But that, that didn't that didn't really impact the cutting. That wasn't the case, right? Because it's pretty harmonically balanced, well constructed. So when the edge alignment is sound. It, even when you like turn the blade, it doesn't really vibrate a lot. So I discovered that it's actually some spots that are just basically completely dull. Whereas like an inch or so from that spot is, is razor sharp and that's really, that's really perplexing. And I can confirm that like during the cutting, the entire, the entire incision is really smooth. And but as it part the target some of the material is just completely torn out it, as if there was no edge at all whereas the the edge next to it the cut next to it is perfectly smooth so it, it seems to be a, like a consistent problem with lk chain source at least some of them I, i've heard different people complaining about this um on their different models uh, and some people just receive a, a blade that's Rings are sharp at the bottom half, and it's not sharpened at all on the top half. That's just, I don't know how you can justify that, because you, you basically only cut with the top half of it. The, the bottom yeah. half is for pairing. It, it doesn't matter if it's even blocked. Like, it just, it's not even properly, like have a very thick bevel. That wouldn't really 
matter that much. It wouldn't really have like an impact during fighting. But you really want the top half to be sharp. And near the tip on my sword, there are some spots you can just feel it's gonna slide off the nail. Yeah, some part is gonna see it's just sliding off the nail, whereas this part it just bite. It will just stay there. So there's some inconsistency there. And, and again, it shows that they're capable of sharpening the sword to the proper degree, to the adequate degree. There's just some, some things wrong with their process that on some of their pieces, there are like dull spots, maybe on all of their pieces. Uh, but some, on some ones, some of them are much more severe and it would just impact the cutting performance. And I think that it's, it's not really difficult for the end user to fix this because the uh, edge bevel is a singular bevel from the spine to the edge. It's just like a V-shaped cross section. It's extremely refined. There's no niku or muscle behind it, which could make it a little bit um, less durable on blade, blade on blade contact. But otherwise, if you encounter organic material, you boom. That's not gonna. That's not gonna be an issue because it's gonna just cut through, slice through, slice through without any issue. So the, the user can easily fix this. Well, I have some experience with sharpening. If the edge bevel is refined, it, it really it takes you maybe two or three minutes to take it to razor sharp. And on this, these dot spots, like just one or two passes, right? It, it's gonna be. It's gonna be totally sharp. Uh, but I, I think that when they sharpen 95% of the edge, there's no justification for them to leave like 5% just blocked. Uh, that's, they, they gotta look at their process of sharpening. I think what's going on here is, you know, these are handmade. I don't know how much handmade they are. I don't know if it's mostly stock removal or forging. I'm not sure exactly how LKHN gets the blades to shape, but they're very clearly hand finished. And the overall design is very good and they get very close to accurate. There's not even a micro bevel here. It's one smooth bevel all the way to the end, but it's just by hand, they are being, I'm guessing they're, you know, when you're doing it by hand, you're running against a belt sander. They're probably wavering a little bit in the, in their motions and they're not being quite consistent enough. And what that tells me is they're also not testing each sword as much as they should be, which is the quality control part, part of it. Because I know I, I know LK Chen does testing on their designs. I, we've seen them post videos of them cutting tatami with the, these models, but they clearly didn't test every single one because on this, this would not pass because right here, I won't say it's dull, it's not blunt here. It's sharp enough that it, I don't wanna run my finger on it along the blade, but it is most definitely less sharp than if I bring it up here where I feel like if I put a whole lot of pressure on it right up here, I'm going to actually cut myself. And I don't wanna do that, obviously. So there's some issues there with consistency. And frankly, it's a problem across the industry for most manufacturers, most makers, even Albion has this problem where it's just the, the edge is not finished correctly. And it's, a, like I said, it's a problem across the industry that really does need to be fixed in my opinion. Now let's take a look at handling and I'll include some handling comparisons to the Connect. So this Kriegsmesser is notably light. It weighs in at around two and three quarters pounds. And honestly, it feels almost more balanced for one hand than two. You know, it's balanced pretty close to the guard, actually considerably closer than I would expect. It's balanced a little past the maker's mark there, which makes this, brings the point of balances pretty far back and means that this has a little bit less authority in the cut than you might expect from a Kriegsmesser. Normally I would expect it to be balanced out more around five inches than where this is. That's not to say this is bad. That means you can maneuver the sword very quickly, very easily, and redirect motion very quickly, very easily. It just is, doesn't have as much out here as perhaps some others. 
but it is, like I said, it's incredibly nimble, one or two-handed. Even though it is definitely intended as a two-hander, I mean, look at that grip. That's a, that's a long grip. It still feels like I could use this in one hand. Yeah, I think the bottom arms is definitely uh, like balance more towards like a one-handed sword or single-handed usage. Like you swing it in single hand, it's just so easy to stop it. It's almost like a saber. Very um, balanced towards foot combat, like an infantry, maybe even an infantry officer saber in late periods. It feels less of a, like a two-handed sword, like a creeps, a war knife, cleave someone in half. I think it's probably geared more towards uh, civilian building, like plain clothes building, where you don't have to like, cleave through a lot of material. Maybe Gambison as well, but yeah. definitely not for armor combat because you really don't want a, a blade this thin and this light to clash a lot with like, heavy plate armor. Um, it, it's not probably not conducive to its uh, overall, you know, integrity or even though it's quite solidly constructed. However, I will say that when I'm doing this one-handed, not so much when I do it two, but when I do it one-handed, the edges of the grip do bite into my hand just a little bit as the weight drags it into the, as it drags it into my palm. It is rubbing against my palm a little bit uncomfortably. It doesn't really happen when I do the, move it around two-handed, but one-handed, it is noticeable. And that is not the tang. That's actually the wood slab here. The tang has, uh, the wood has shrunk a little bit from the tang and there are ledges here, but they are very minor and they don't really bite into the hand at all. When I'm doing this one-handed, it is actually the wood biting into the hand, which is a little surprising because it is, it is chamfered some, but it's a pretty crisp edge and it could choose, it could be a little bit uh, more softened and rounded, just a little bit more to help with that. And here I have the Balor Arms Kriegsmesser and the Albion Connect. The main thing to note is that the, the Connect is about five ounces heavier than the Balor Arms. It's balanced a little further out. And if you look at the specs, you can see that it starts considerably thicker and the distal taper is a bit more complex than the Balor Arms one. It's not exactly surprising considering this sold for around 1600 new. This is close to 500 new. So the Connect is about a three, costs about three times as much if you could still get it. Because this sword does have a lot of distal taper, it does flex quite a bit, not excessively, but this is quite a bit of flex for a single-edge sword. Typically you'll find single-edge swords a bit less flexible than double-edge, but this one definitely has some flex to it. If we look at the vibration node, you know, it's right around near the end of the fuller, and this is a good spot. This is exactly where you want the vibration node, the percussion node to be, because it is around two-thirds of the way up the blade, and that's just the natural sweet spot for cutting with most European swords. It's right around in that spot. It really, the, the harmonics of the blade helps the grip. If the grip, if the blade vibrates a lot in the ten, and you can feel it through the grip and the hilt, that's gonna bother me a lot more, but this is not the case, right? Like it just, the harmonic nodes are in the right place. Let's compare that to the connect here. So it's a little bit less flexible, not a lot less, but a little bit more rigid, which makes sense because it starts thicker and it is thicker throughout most of the blade. If we look at the vibration note on it, you can see it vibrates less, a little bit less, but the percussion note is in just about the same spot, uh, which is two thirds of the way up the blade right near the end of the fuller. So when I pick this up again, after holding the connect, you didn't, you don't think five ounces is that much, but man, you immediately feel it. This is a noticeably light and nimble sword. I think it's not like the Balor Arms LK Chen Italian longsword. They didn't go too far on thinning this one out, but it is still incredibly nimble. So pick it, incredibly nimble, right? Let's see with the connect. Pick this up, instantly feels 
definitely more powerful. It's definitely got more authority in the cut, but this is still very nimble. Yeah, this is still a very nimble sword. What I will say though is it doesn't feel particularly good one-handed. It's usable, but you're definitely, when I, when I do this one-handed, it definitely starts to feel a little tip heavy and kind of pull out the weight rather than the Balor Arms one that feels like I'm just moving it around like it wants to be moved. This definitely feels much more natural two-handed. Something else to note about the Kinect, you know, when I mentioned about the grip scales, one-handed, no problem at all. This is exactly what you would expect. Albion has a ton of attention to their fit and finish. And even though the edges here are crisp, there's no biting into the hand. It is noticeable that this is the Albion Connect Mark II, which has the grip scales completely encapsulate the tang. So there's no issue with the tang, with the grip uh, contracting a little bit and leaving ledges from the, from the tang. Some people prefer the full tang style where you can actually see this tang. Some people prefer this style. I think personally, I do prefer this one. It has less rust issues, less issues with the tang becoming a hot spot. And I just like the way this one feels. Another comparison to look at is the Kriegsmesser to the Albion Mercenary. Now these might look like very odd comparisons, but I'm going with this because they're approximately the same blade length the Mercenary definitely has a slightly shorter grippable area, but it's pretty comparable thanks to the length of the scent stopper. And the weights are not very different. The Mercenary weighs about three and a half ounces more than the Kriegsmesser. So let's move this around a little bit. It is, it is so noticeable just how light and agile this is. And despite it having a decent amount of flex, I don't find that the sword wobbles at all when cutting, which is really good. I, that wobble makes for difficult cuts and you know, not having a wobble, that, that makes it easier for me to get good cuts. So let's take a look at the Mercenary. So it only weighs three and a half ounces more, but it is definitely noticeable. It has more blade presence. The tip feels more substantial. You know, when I move this out here, I feel some weight out here, not in a bad way at all. This sword actually probably, the best way I can put it, it just feels more substantial than the, the not the Kinect, than the, the Balor Arms Kriegsmesser. It feels, let me grab this. Yeah, I pick this up and it's just like, wow, this is light and nimble. I pick up the Mercenary, it's light and nimble too, but it just feels, substantial. It feels like it has authority and it just like it's there and it's present. I feel like I'm doing a terrible job explaining this, but yeah, the, the Kriegsmesser, I, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot out here. It feels notably light out here and the Mercenary has presence out there. So that's probably something to do with their point of balance. Let's take a look at that again. So there's the Kriegsmesser's point of balance. That looks like about three and a half inches. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. It is in my stats though. Let's take a look at the Mercenary. I don't remember what this point of balance is at all. That actually looks like not too different, which is interesting, but yeah, doesn't feel it feels like it has more out there and about the same amount of wobble. So that's really interesting to me is that the Kriegsmesser does not feel like it has as much blade presence as this Mercenary does. All right, and as this review is wrapping up, here are my closing thoughts. First off, this sword is absolutely worth the asking price of $468. The Kriegsmesser market is vastly underserved. So it's nice to see a good example in the low mid-range price point. It's very good looking. It's a lot of fun to move around. Kane's is easily sharp enough, as he put it, to be a competition cutter. That said, there are definitely some downsides here. And the most obvious one is the controversy over its design. Is that a problem to you? I can't answer that. For me, 
it is a little bit problematic. I want to respect Mr. Johnson's work and his opinion, and while I personally think this sword is different enough from the Kinect to warrant uh, making it and not being plagiaristic, you know, it's kind of not up to me. <laughs> you know, Mr. Johnson is renowned for his knowledge, his design, his swords, his research, and I want to honor his opinion. So it's kind of a catch-22. I think it's okay. He doesn't. Where does that put me? I'm honestly not really sure. <laughs> And with Cult of Athena acknowledging Mr. Johnson's point and admitting that there is a problem here and stating that they will not be releasing more of this model, it's kind of a moot point. I am greatly looking forward to seeing their new redesigned Kriegsmesser for 2024. Perhaps they will take even more inspiration from the hunting messers of Maximilian I and reproduce something that we have not seen in the market yet. Like I said, the Kriegsmesser market is vastly underserved, so there is a huge opportunity here for Cult of Athena to really wow us. The other big downside to me is the unevenness in the sharpening. You know, my sword is exactly at the point of percussion, the dullest part of the blade, and that's where you want it to be, the sharpest. You want to get all your cuts right at the point of percussion, and it being duller there is not good for cutting. Now, I don't think it would take very much to sharpen this up because the beveling is so well done. And it's one smooth bevel. It could be sharpened up very quickly, I think. But I shouldn't have to do that. I shouldn't need to worry about that. LK Chen has proved that they can put a, an incredibly sharp edge on it right up here near the tip. It's very, very sharp. So the fact that it's not at the point of percussion is a lack of quality control on LK Chen's part and they should do better on that. And the last downside is more of a personal preference thing, and I would like a little bit more authority in the cut. This sword is a little bit too focused on the nimbleness side, in my opinion. This is actually similar to the Italian longsword, but not as egregious as that one. This is still an effective design. I would just like to see the sword beefed up a little bit and just bring the point of balance out to four, four and a half inches, five, somewhere around there, where it really feels like a good cutter rather than focused on agility and nimbleness. And this is coming from somebody who loves agile swords. It's just that this one, it feels like it has almost no blade presence. It has some, it's more, better, like I said, better than the Italian longsword, but it's still just a little bit too not there. I don't feel fully connected to the blade when cutting because it's so light and nimble. And that's going to wrap up this rather unusual review. I want to give a shout out to Kane Shen and thank you for collaborating with me on this review. It was a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to doing it for the Balor Arms Alexandria as well. For my viewers, go check out Kane's channel. He's got a ton of sword reviews. He puts them out about around the same schedule as me and he's a great reviewer. If you haven't, please like this video and subscribe if you haven't. Until next time, Alien 2 out.